Now, from the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Welcome to the World Over Live. We have some great guests for you tonight. I'll bring you my exclusive interview with Canadian publishing mogul Conrad Black about his new memoir, A Matter of Principle. And later, I'll talk with actor and singer Robert Davi about his latest project, a tribute to Frank Sinatra. We have lots to cover, but first, here's tonight's Vaticano. Giving a joyful testimony to the truth of the gospel, which frees minds and illuminates the efforts to live wisely and well in society, this was the challenge launched a year ago by Pope Benedict on occasion of his visit to the United Kingdom from the 16th to the 19th of September 2010. An exhortation reintroduced recently in a message sent by the Pope to Catholics across the Channel who celebrated the first anniversary of the Pope's visit with different meetings and masses of Thanksgiving in Westminster Abbey. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, mentioned that the visit was a great gift for all the Christian communities in the United Kingdom, while the British Prime Minister David Cameron underlined the importance of building a culture of social responsibility. The celebrations were also attended by the Ambassador of Great Britain to the Holy See, Nigel Marcus Baker, who remembers the Pope's visit. When the British public had a chance to see him in the flesh, to get to know him, to listen to his speeches carefully. I think they understand, understood that this was a Pope who cared deeply about the issues that they cared about. A year ago, the Pope gave a reminder of the risks of our times, like that of losing roots and reference points. This past summer in London and in other British cities, there were social clashes and protests, making dialogue between different realities and increasingly topical issue. I think this is, this is the point. Yes, a government can help provide space, can apply legislation, and then it has to step back, encouraging, but allowing civil society, allowing schools, allowing families, allowing faith groups to get on with that work. Catholics in the United Kingdom still clearly remember the beatification ceremony in Birmingham of John Henry Cardinal Newman, a real witness to the possibility of dialogue between faith and reason. Also still touching are Benedict XVI's words on what he himself described as the shameful abuse of children and young people by priests and religious members, a wound he added that seriously undermines the moral credibility of those leading in the church. At the Nunciator in London, he met with some of those victims very clear the deep shame within the church uh, for these crimes committed by people uh, within, from within the church. And part of that is absolutely focusing on the victims, you know, the, the asking forgiveness to the victims, which Pope Benedict XVI did in the United Kingdom and has done many times over the years, I think is a fundamental part of the future of healing process from this terrible uh, series of, uh, of events but also that recognition of need to rebuild trust, which goes back to Newman. The need that the church more broadly and individual priests need to work incredibly closely with their communities, with families, with children to rebuild trust. When we return, British peer, author, publisher and Catholic, Conrad Black. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay with us. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. My first guest is well known in his native Canada. He's a British peer. He's also former head of Hollinger International, one of the world's largest publishing groups. Their holdings included the London Telegraph Papers, the Chicago Sun-Times, Canada's National Post, and countless others. He's also a prolific author. In 2005, his life changed drastically. He was charged with 17 counts of corporate misconduct here in the U.S and eventually convicted and sent to jail. 
He served 29 months in prison until the Supreme Court overturned most of those charges. That's when a lower court ordered him back to jail. He's there today. We spoke to Lord Conrad Black before he went to prison about how this experience has changed his character and deepened his faith. His new book is called A Matter of Principle, where he sets the record straight. Now, Lord Black, you were publisher of some of the world's great papers. Give me a sense, first of all, I want to kind of start this story at the beginning. How did you get into the publishing trade in the 1960s? What drew you to this? Uh, well, I, I was at loose ends after my time as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine owned a weekly newspaper that wasn't particularly prosperous. And, uh, you know, the autumn was coming on. I had nothing else to do. And he said, well, why don't you take this over? Because he'd taken a, a job as the chief of staff to a prominent politician in Canada. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I did. And, and uh, so I was the editor and the publisher, and I did the advertising selling. And so I became quite immersed in the basic newspaper business. Mm -hmm. I could do everything except operate the press. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the beginning. Then you started acquiring other papers? And... <clears throat> then the local daily got into difficulties. And at this time, I was a law student, but almost mm -hmm. finished it. And, um, and, and we could buy it very cheaply because the, it had real financial problems and the press had been repossessed and, and it, we made it quite profitable and we just built the company from there. Amazing. And then you found Hollinger International, which becomes sort of the, the umbrella organization that <coughs> runs and owns all of these papers. But you were very hands-on, which I was, uh, and in the book you go into great detail about really running the Telegraph. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were very immersed in, in the London Telegraph. Tell me about that. And, um, what do you, how do you imagine that set you up, if you will, in the public consciousness? Well, in Britain, you know, it's a tremendously reading-oriented culture. Mm -hmm. And the national newspapers, the London morning papers, circulate throughout the country. There's only one time zone in Britain. It's not like here. And, uh, and, and it's not a big country, though it has 65 million people. You can, you can get the newspapers around. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the owners of the big newspapers are public personalities in Britain mm -hmm. in a way that is not usually the case here sometimes but not usually mm -hmm. and um, and and so I sort of came into that position now the telegraph was in a distressed condition we got it financially mm -hmm. but it had a big circulation an aging circulation so it was falling off but you know we repositioned it editorially and made it a full service newspaper which it had not been before it was mm -hmm. a news and sports paper basically right. and that was all uh, and, and we, so we, we, the, we stopped the erosion of the circulation and held it at over a million, mm -hmm. which was, along with the New York Times and at the time the Los Angeles Times, the largest broadsheet newspaper circulation in the world. Oh. And, and uh, so we, you know, we, we certainly had a very powerful entity there that was now, respected throughout Europe. You then convert to Catholicism at some point. Tell me what was the well, precursor that was, that to that. Well, that was early on. That wasn't... Mm -hmm. uh, 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 that that was a process that went on for some time. And when I was received, mm -hmm. uh, it was just the start of the Telegraph time. I hadn't actually uh -huh. taken the paper over at that time. Uh huh. I, I almost had, but not quite. Was it an intellectual conversion first? Going? Uh, yes. Did you read your way into the church, if you will? Yes, mainly reading Newman, but others as well. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit. Uh, also, uh, my relations with two of the Canadian cardinals, Cardinal Leger in Montreal and uh, Car Cardinal Carter in Toronto, was a dear friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Now, you, so you had this public <coughs> platform, this enormous megaphone, if you will, both in Europe, in Canada, and in the United States. Well, being, not so much in the U.S., yeah, but in the, the other two, yeah. yeah but you, were, you were more hands-on with the other two, certainly. Yeah. You are chairman of Hollinger, and... A disgruntled shareholder is very upset, and he demands and levels charges at you and demands some inquiry into this. What did you think of this when these charges were first brought forward? Well, it, it, he didn't actually bring charges in, in, in any conventional sense. Mm -hmm. He didn't sue me. Uh, uh, but what he did, you see, he was trying to force a sale of the company, and he mistakenly thought that a company that was spread around between different countries mm -hmm. would easily find a buyer, mm -hmm. the way, for example, Knight Ritter did when it was mm -hmm. a big newspaper company, but all in the United States. Right. Uh, investors could, could lock onto that as a concept much more easily, you see. Mm -hmm. And I warned him that that wasn't going to work. I, I, and, and we had indeed sold large chunks of assets in both the US and Canada very, very advantageously. 
And I said, uh, you know, I, I have some concerns about the future of the newspaper business. I couldn't go too far in public because I'm trying right. to, you know, up, you know, uphold this business, right. promote it, not in a, in a false sense, but in a upbeat sense, you see. And, uh, and, and he was uh, giving interviews to our competitors, especially in London, saying that I was uh, running the company not in the shareholders' interest, and outrageous things like this. And so he asked for a special committee. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know what a special committee was in practice in this country, but I said, that's fine with me. If it's a matter of an impartial inquiry, let's do it, because I don't want any more of these suggestions that, mm -hmm. been any, uh, that there's been any inappropriate behavior by anyone in management. Mm -hmm. and, and so at that point, I thought it was uh, going to be a positive thing. It might be a bit rigorous, but at least it would be the end of it. And then the special committee <coughs> report comes out, and of course... Well, there were some problems before that. They, the special committee did discover that one of my associates had been mm -hmm. uh, a bit slapdash uh, mm -hmm. and, and in fact had not always acted in good faith. Mm -hmm. So they took this up and in the American manner the dominoes started to roll, you see. Mm -hmm. the, 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 this guy essentially said, well don't bother me, I can, uh, I, you know, I, I can, I can bring down someone bigger than myself, you mm -hmm. say, and, and, and that's how the plea bargain system works. So mm -hmm. all this was going on without my knowing anything about it. The, the, and then they brought out the report, and, and, uh, and, and, and of course everything blew up after that. Now t tell me for a moment, to paint the picture for people here, uh, how did this case though get into the American court system? How did it, well, because, because it was Hollinger an international, international company. Was, it was an American company, mm -hmm. New York Stock Exchange listing, and the head office was in Chicago. Uh -huh. That's why the case was in Chicago. So then it goes to Patrick Fitzgerald. Yes. Now, Radler is the person you're speaking of earlier, David Radler. He was the associate. As the associate, yes. Now, you all, he was charged, we should say, as well, and you were part of a joint defense team, correct? Uh, yes, but when he was charged, uh, he, he, it, was, he, it, it was clear that he'd be a cooperating witness, and, he, uh -huh. and he, he, he presented this complete fiction to the grand jury at the same time he was charged, you see. Mm -hmm. And then they begin to, they, they move forward with 17 <coughs> charges against you, and, it, and it's everything from mail fraud, wire fraud, money laundering, obstruction of justice. I mean, it goes on and on. was the Racketeer. real uh, $600 million, they say, you, you were defrauding from your... your uh, stockholders, uh, siphoning off 84 million from the papers and the magazines. Yeah, they, 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 it gradually from? came down from from 600 to uh, about 140 to mm -hmm. 84 to 20 uh, to six to 285,000, which I am innocent, just as I am of all the rest of it. But that's what we're stuck with because that's what the the, mm -hmm. the appellate panel, when called upon to address mm -hmm. the gravity of their own errors, uh, salvaged that quite spuriously from all these counts that had failed, you see. And now you're acquitted of nine charges pretty quickly. Four were dropped. Thirteen went to the jury, nine were acquittals, and then, mm -hmm. and then four got up to the Supreme Court. Now there was this matter of moving boxes. You apparently moved boxes out of your office. Now we should tell people the story. You had previously installed a security camera mm -hmm. to make sure that things weren't taken or brought in inappropriately yeah. into the office. Yeah. So you got permission to remove these boxes, correct? Uh, from the acting president right. of the company, yeah. And, and you removed the boxes? I mean, I, I, it should be said that I, 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 I owned the building and I'd had my office there for 27 years, mm -hmm. but in this horrible atmosphere, this completely poisoned atmosphere, mm -hmm. one of the local courts in, in Toronto decided that I had to leave the office. Mm -hmm. So uh, my assistant, she packed these boxes, she designated them as boxes to move, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then she was stopped from doing it. And I came into the office that day, not because of that, but just by coincidence. And, uh, and, and I said, well, look, but there's a document retention order on, on certain categories of things. Is anything in here uh, offensive to that? And she said, absolutely no, I wouldn't do that. So I, I, then I spoke to the acting president. He said, well, that's fine. And he questioned the woman who works with me, and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, she answered all his questions. He said, well, that's fine, take it out. Mm -hmm. So we were taking it out. We took it out. 
And they have video of you taking it yeah, out yeah, from the cameras you yeah, installed. Yeah, and at one point I pointed to one of the cameras and said, I want to make sure that all this is on film because I don't want any suggestion that anything was done, mm -hmm. you know, surreptitiously or But that becomes or. the evidence, so-called evidence, that yeah. they wave around saying you obstructed justice. Exactly. And they put, though, they put about a, a grainy film. I mean, the security camera isn't a particularly good yeah. picture, you know, stuff yeah. like your cameras here. Yeah. And, and, and so they're grainy pictures. Anyone, e even, even a saint, looks <laughs> dubious <laughs> in that kind of in that kind of film music. Mm -hmm. So long and the short of it is you are convicted on four charges. Four charges, yeah, th three fraud and one obstruction and then, mm -hmm. and then we got them all vacated at the Supreme Court. Yeah, you continue to appeal but you do go to prison. Indeed. And in the book you write about going to prison and you say, you say at that moment you recalled John Paul II's advice to a cardinal who had a stroke. Do you remember what that was? Yes, it was my friend Cardinal Carter and he said you must rejoice and the cardinal said well Holy Father, um, I'm doing my best with this, and I think I'm conducting my office uh, completely. I don't, I don't think I, I'm failing the Archdiocese in any respect. Uh, but I did love to ski, I love to play tennis, and I, it is hard for me to see where I should rejoice. And the Pope said, because you have been singled out, because of your strength of character, as a person who can bear this burden and inspire others. Now, the, the late Pope was a man of unusual <laughs> spiritual strength, as we know, and uh, even the Cardinal, who was a great man and a dear friend, uh, had difficulty taking it completely on board in practice, but it was still an mm -hmm. inspiring thought. Is, is that how you, you helped process this with your faith? I mean, you had to feel a bit of the, the ghost of Thomas More over your shoulder at that time. I mean, you're going in, you're innocent of these charges. Yes. Uh, as time will will unveil mm -hmm. to, the, to, the greater, to the larger world, but at that moment you know you're innocent well, it, to these charges. It's substantially been unveiled now, mm -hmm. I think, but, uh, but it'll, that process will continue. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, these charges are rubbish and no one of looks course. at them seriously. But, but, you, you, but nonetheless, there you are in federal prison, the world is still throwing rocks <coughs> at you, laughing at you, your enemies are scorning you at this moment and, and feel vindicated that they've somehow sent you to federal prison. The day you enter there in Florida, what did you think? Well, I, you know, the imagination is always more torturing than reality. So mm -hmm. I, I had a greater fear of prison, or that prison anyway, than proved to be justified. Mm -hmm. Although I did have the advantage of speaking to someone who'd been there, uh, and so my fears were somewhat mitigated. You know all the stories that mm -hmm. go about, about yeah. violence in prison right. and that kind of thing. And, uh, and then once I got there and saw that uh, the personnel, while, while they were unskilled labor and, and, and uh, 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 nothing to write home about, most mm -hmm. of them, were not, uh, with only a couple of exceptions, actually bad people. Yeah. And, and the, the, I'm referring to the people who work yeah. for the regime, you see, and the, the residents, the inmates, uh, were, were uh, quite pleasant and, and sociable and, uh, mm -hmm. and interesting. I mean, some of them are scoundrels, but, the, sure. but, but quite you know, charming Easy to get along with one on sure. one. Yeah. yeah. Once I saw it, I thought that I had finally turned the corner, that, that this was the worst they could do and it was survivable. Mm -hmm. Now at that point I was looking at serving a sentence of over five years and of course that, that we got rid of most of that. But, yeah. the, uh, but, uh, but at, at least I thought, you know, it, it, this isn't going to end in, 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 a, uh, you know, in, in something absolutely yeah. personally terrible. You right. Know? What is the practice, what is it like to attempt to practice your faith? in that confined uh, not, role? Uh, not that bad, because one thing I will give uh, the Bureau of Prisons, and, and I think this applies essentially to the whole United States government, mm -hmm. while, they, uh, while, while they do terrible things to dehumanize people and, and humiliate them, they, they do not challenge their right to worship mm -hmm. in, in any denomination. And mm -hmm. all of the religious denominations mm -hmm. were present in, in that facility. And, while there was some, in my opinion, mistreatment of our Roman Catholic group by, by the Baptist chaplain, mm -hmm. uh, in general, uh, we, we, could, we could practice perfectly adequately as we wished. You, you write of a Nigerian pastor, a, yes. a, a, a uh, priest in the, in the yes. prison. Tell me about him and the hope that he brought you amid this well, he, he was quite uh, critical of the regime, you see, of the way the Bureau of Prisons was run as mm -hmm. it affected him. Uh, and he would start by saying, uh, for the next half hour, you are in no one's bondage. You are free men here. Mm. 
and and uh, and he would encourage everyone not to be discouraged or intimidated by the uh, what he clearly represented as a gratuitously oppressive regime, which in many respects it is. Hmm. And and uh, and and it, it was it was it was really quite heartening. I thought it was a obviously uh, everything is to scale, but it reminded me of of, of the the opposition to oppression of Cardinal Menzenti and mm. Cardinal Wyszynski and mm. Hungary mm. and Poland people. You, you, you quote the line in the book, uh, resistance to tyranny is obedience to God, which yeah. is attributed to Jesuits. Yes. Um, did that line take on particular meaning once you found it? Frequently, there? although I, I, I don't want to try and pretend that I was uh, obstructive of the regime. Mm -hmm. I, I reached a, instantly almost mm -hmm. a modus operandi with them, and they didn't really bother me. I didn't, I didn't violate any of their rules, even though many of them are petty, fogging, and absurd. Mm -hmm. I didn't violate them, and they didn't bother me. Hmm. So I, I, I had I had no I had no so-called infractions. Well, you, I had an unblemished record. You actually inmate. seem to turn into a model prisoner. I mean, not only are you there, you actually are doing good while there. You were a tutor. Yes. You were teaching English. You were teaching history. Um, yeah. w what was your relationship like with people who, quite frankly, Lord Black, you would not have encountered probably in your social sphere in the in your entire life? Um, well, I, I see. I get on well with almost everybody yeah. and I think perhaps some of them were because there was a lot of publicity of my case and mm -hmm. there was uh, there was a lot of press there the when I arrived so, so they, they, they were aware to mm -hmm. some degree of who I was you think mm -hmm. and um, and I, I may, it may be that some of them thought oh well here's a prominent person he'll, yeah. be, a, he'll be a terrible snob or something and yeah. I, they could see that I wasn't so mm -hmm. we got on fine. Now throughout this whole process you're incarcerated and then you continue your appeals. It goes to the Supreme Court, and in 2010, they finally hear the case. It's very rare. And they vacate all the charges. Yes. But then they make this very odd, their instructions are not terribly explicit. And they send it back to this Judge Posner, who was the reason you were in the, in the pickle you were in in the first place. Well, uh, not quite the first place. The trial judge uh, was, a, was a, uh, I thought, a, 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 an essentially a reasonable judge. Mm -hmm. uh, they, it was then appealed to a panel of three uh, judges of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago. In Chicago. Posner was the chairman, the former chief judge. Mm -hmm. And he, I, I have not seen or heard such an outrageous mistreatment of counsel since uh, I watched news film of the famous trials <laughs> following the attempt on Hitler's life in July 20th, 1944. <laughs> you know, raving Roland Freisler yeah. in the Nazi People's <laughs> Court. Now, I, I don't want to call Posner a Nazi. That would not be fair. But yeah. he was just about as rude, shouting at the lawyers and interrupting them, <laughs> not letting them make a point at all. And, and my lawyer was the former deputy solicitor general of this country for 16 years. He was mm -hmm. a very mm -hmm. respected man. He is a respected man. Miguel Estrada. Uh, well known throughout the prominent bar and bench mm -hmm. of the entire country. And, and, uh, and it would be a, a wrong and a bad thing to treat any member of the bar in the way Posner treated him, but to treat someone of that stature was scandalous. Now, the, Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg, calls this the infirmity of invented law. They were talking about this honest services statute. Yes. Tell us about this and translate it, because it's so difficult to understand. Well, what this the is all basis about. of our appeal, as you know, the Supreme Court yeah. is a trier of law and not of fact, so mm -hmm. we couldn't argue the facts anymore, even though they'd been completely distorted by Posner. Uh, so the point of constitutional law we hung our appeal on was that the honest services statute was charged as an offense along with specific offenses, you see, mm -hmm. uh, the various frauds and so forth. And, and our contention was that since there wasn't a, a distinction in the verdict form, there was no way of telling upon which basis the jury had convicted. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and therefore, they were likely to, to have convicted on honest services. And that was a statute that was essentially put in place uh, approximately 30 years ago to deal with public officials taking bribes, where mm -hmm. a, a person would, would give a contract to somebody and take a bribe. It didn't actually cost the taxpayers anything. anything. Mm -hmm. It was corrupt behavior, but, but not costly mm -hmm. the taxpayers, so you had this requirement for honest services. Well, like so many statutes in this country, like 
racketeering mm -hmm. influenced corrupt organizations. Right. You know, RICO, it, it, it's twisted around. I mean, RICO you know, has been leveled against the Cardinal Archbishop the of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and, and um, uh, you know, as if he was a gangster or something. The Honest Services Statute, as, as one of the justices said, could apply to almost everybody in, in the entire labor force of the United States. You could technically, as one of them, as the Chief Justice, Robert right. said, if a man uh, phoned in sick and to, in fact wasn't sick and took his son to a baseball game uh, uh, on his birthday, mm -hmm. um, in theory he'd be violating the honest service statute and could, and, and could be not only fired but charged with a crime. Mm -hmm. And it's not a crime. It's may, it may be a legitimate complaint by his employer, right. but it's not a but crime. It's not a crime. And so the, 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 all the counts were vacated on the grounds that it, the, they See, might indeed have been based upon conviction of that sort. When the public hears that the Supreme Court throughout vacated all the charges. They assume, well now, then Conrad Black must go free. That's not what happens. They then send this case back to the judge, Posner, and he reinterprets it. How do you end up back in prison? And you are headed back to prison now. Mm. Well, uh, On what grounds, Conrad? Well, you see, Posner and, and the other two panelists mm -hmm. took it back and I don't think there's much doubt that Posner, and I, I do not know the origins of the, of the malice that he has towards me because mm -hmm. I never have encountered him at all. I suspect that there may have been some dissent in his panel, but in any case, where he came out at the end was that he accepted that the two main counts uh, were discarded. And, of fraud. And, and, yeah, and, 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 and that they, they, they were, in fact, overturned mm -hmm. as convictions. And, um, uh, but he upheld obstruction and he upheld the least of the fraud counts, $285,000. Mm -hmm. Now he did so on the basis of, of a monstrous distortion of evidence and indeed a fabrication of evidence. Mm -hmm. And we appealed that back to the Supreme Court and since they don't try on the basis of facts, we had to hang it on the argument that he had usurped my right to a jury trial by presuming mistakenly on what the jury re jury's mm -hmm. reasoning was. You think. Right. Uh, but the Supreme Court, as a matter of practice, almost never takes an appeal yeah. back after it's heard it once. So uh, we were stuck with Posner's two convictions, and then we had to go back to the trial judge for, oh. I did, I should say, for Reese. All the other, my co-defendants are all home and free now, but, uh, um, uh, and, and she, even though there was a probation office recommendation that I'd be released for time. Sorry. An amount of letters that everyone from Henry Kissinger to, to uh, uh, your fellow inmates yes, wrote to her. Yes, good many of those, yeah. And some personnel of the, of the, of the prison too. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the um, trial judge was being urged by the prosecution and by Posner to reimpose the original sentence. Mm -hmm. And, and I think in practice in this country, the lowest sentence you can give in a thing like this is six months. And in fact, she's come up at just under eight months. So that's what I have to do. I mean, it's an outrage, but the whole thing is an outrage. Yeah. I mean, given the way the system works, given the correlation of forces between the US government and myself, mm -hmm. and as you say, the US government aided by almost a unanimous media. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I had my supporters, but they, they were they Who totally voices reversed the themselves, we should say, once the Supreme Court vacated the charges, suddenly everybody's coming out, oh, Lord Black, of course we knew he was innocent all the time. Not quite as egregious as that, but mm -hmm. so, opinion has turned a lot. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think we must accept the grace of conversion here. I mean, yeah. Some of it is sincere. <laughs> You're sometimes more charitable than I am, I think. <laughs> uh, looking back on this, and we should say, in the next few weeks, as we're recording this, this will air once you're back in federal prison. Mm. This has to still stick in your side. It's, it's very nerve-wracking and very uh, upsetting, yes. Has it deepened your faith at all, the uh, experience? Uh, it, 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 hasn't, it certainly hasn't diminished it, anyway. It was reasonably strong to begin with, and it still is. Mm -hmm. It didn't shake it? No. no. How, what? I can only imagine what your legal bills must have been like. Because we should tell people, not only were you defending yourself, the company that you'd spent decades building was destroyed Completely because destroyed. of the process. Yeah, and 85% and, and, uh, and of the shares were in the hands of just average members of the public. And, uh, mm -hmm. and their interest was just completely vaporized. Two billion dollars. As a result of the, uh, the controversy well, surrounding the, this case. Well, the, the, the companies on court orders were taken over by our accusers 
who, who paid themselves staggering sums, both uh, as management and as legal counsel, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they drove these companies into bankruptcy. And they were flourishing companies when they took them mm -hmm. over. What is the lesson here for those who may be facing accusation in the justice system here in the United States? Uh, I think, if, if, for, if I may presume, for the country as a whole, there are terrible problems with this justice system. This country has six to 14 times as many incarcerated people per capita mm -hmm. as comparable countries, by which I mean rich, flourishing mm -hmm. democracies, prosperous democracies. Mm -hmm. The prosecution wins over 90% of their cases. Uh, the prosecution speaks last before the jury. The rules of administration of evidence are very uneven. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there, there's a whole group of statutes that are catchments that it's impossible to defend yourself against. We knock down one of them. But, but it's impossible to defend yourself against obstruction of justice. They can construe that as anything. No. And, and, and they can persuade, they, they then throw about 80 counts at you, or mm -hmm. at least... Hoping some of it will stick, yeah, no matter what. it's just throwing spaghetti at the wall and some mm -hmm. will stick. Uh, there, there are 47 million people in the American population who have a criminal record. Mm -hmm. Now, admittedly, most of it is not stigmatizing. It's a, a DUI 20 years ago, mm -hmm. or disorderly behavior at a fraternity party 25 yeah. years ago, or something like that. Sure. But, but many people are scarred for life unjustly, and, and almost everyone is convicted, and almost mm -hmm. everyone is over-sentenced. Mm. So you have these problems at each level, and, and, uh, and, and there, there's evidence that surfaces all the time of absolutely scandalous behavior by prosecutors, mm -hmm. and, and it's almost never, uh, it's almost, there's almost no sanction on it. I mean, in our own case, we caught them again and again lying to the court, yeah. and there, 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 they didn't get any rebuke from the judge, and, and, uh, and all, all, most of the judges are ex-prosecutors. It's, it's not a fair process at all. And the, the obstruction of justice charge that you're essentially being sent back to prison for now, this is all to do with the removal of these boxes? Yeah, in another country, when it was not disputed in the evidence that I had nothing to do with selecting uh, the papers the boxes, and, yeah. and, and everything in it they already had, mm -hmm. other than some personal things, you know, yeah. letters of condolence, my brother died, but that's not relevant to this right. case. Right, So there was nothing incriminating even in the boxes you were moving? Absolutely not. And by the way, if I'd wanted to take anything out of them, I could have done it at any time in a, in, in a briefcase or in my pocket. Mm -hmm. There was no searching of people leaving the building. I mean, I would have had to be mad to do that, mm -hmm. apart from dishonest. Lord Black, you had the means, quite frankly, to defend yourself. And, and had it, thank God you had the means in other countries, or you wouldn't have had the means at all. This is true. You spent millions defending yourself. Tens of millions. What does someone who doesn't have those sorts of resources do? Are well, they in victims? practice, they, 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 they go through their resources very quickly. They are put in the hands of the public defenders, who are just stooges of the prosecutors. Mm -hmm. They're paid by the court, and they're paid on the basis of how many people they deal with, not mm -hmm. uh, what kind of service they give. Mm -hmm. and, and in practice, they always say, well, you have no chance, so you've got to plead guilty, and I'll get you this deal. And usually, they, they're double-crossed on the deal, and there's nothing you can do. So it, the fact is, the people who can't really fight the system are pulverized to dust. Hmm. And, and I'm not implying that none of them is guilty, by the way. Sure. Obviously, a great many of them, probably a majority, in fact, almost certainly a majority, are guilty of something. Mm -hmm. but, but a, a, a significant a number are doubt. innocent, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and uh, very few of them get a fair trial. Mm -hmm. And almost all those who are convicted are over-sentenced. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is not what Madison and the other authors of the Constitution had in mind. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments promise due process, no seizure of property without just mm -hmm. compensation. The grand jury is an assurance against capricious prosecution. Uh, access to counsel, an impartial mm -hmm. jury, reasonable bail, prompt justice. I didn't get any of that. Has it, I imagine it's made you a bit bitter toward the country or what's become of it after someone who, we should say, has written love letters to this country mm -hmm. via your articles, books on, on, on Nixon, FDR, a, a forthcoming book. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, it, it, it has, I mean, in fairness, it hasn't ceased to be a great country just because it's persecuted me half to mm -hmm. death. But uh, it has certainly, it, is, it has had an impact on my affection for the country. Not, not my respect for its history, but my, my regard for it as it is now. Yes, mm -hmm. it has. Not, not obviously for a great many 
individual Americans whom mm -hmm. I like and admire, but, but for the country, yes, it is. It couldn't fail to. What will you do now, once, once you, once well, you get out of prison? I'll be through with this in eight months, so uh, less than eight months when this airs. So, um, I, well, I'll, I'll go back to Britain and Canada, and, I'll, and I'll, one, one thing that has happened in all this is my career as a writer is somewhat uh, uh, taken off, so I, I'll mm -hmm. stick with that, and I'll go back to being an investor. Fortunately, I have enough left that I have something to invest in, mm -hmm. I, and, I, and I have, if I may say it, a successful track record in that area. Mm -hmm. Well, Lord Black will be watching your next act here, and I know there's another act coming. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you. Thanks for having me. A Matter of Principle by Conrad Black is available at bookstores everywhere and online at all the usual outlets. When we return, Hollywood actor Robert Davi will discuss his faith and his latest project, a tribute to the music of Frank Sinatra, whom he knew. He'll tell you all about it when the world of our lives continues in a moment. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Well, you probably know him best as a Bond villain from Goonies, Die Hard. The man is ubiquitous and has been in cinema through most of his life. But now, he's changing tack ever so slightly. He's now taking on Frank Sinatra. Would you welcome to the program Robert Dobby? Hey, 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 Raymond. Great to have you. I wouldn't say take on Sinatra. I'm oh. paying tribute to Sinatra. Paying tribute to Sinatra. Well, yeah. it is taking on. I would on. never want to take him on. This is a pretty heavy, this is a you pretty know, heavy I, responsibility, I, carrying these songs to a new generation. Yeah. That's what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. That's... We got a glimpse of the musical side of Robert Davi when The Dukes came out, which is a film you uh, directed, starred in, uh, and, and we got a little bit of your singing. Why did you feel called at this moment to produce this album, Davi Sings Sinatra? Well, it's Davi Sings Sinatra on the road to romance. Several reasons. I started out as a singer, as you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that was my first big passion. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a few, uh, th there was something brewing in me when I did the Dukes that I wanted mm -hmm. to go into singing and, 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 and communicate through song. And there's also where you feel something in the country that there was this music responded to. That this, this music, when my parents grew up, mm -hmm. there was a, we were going through difficult times. Sure. And uh, it was an optimistic, hopeful thing, you know, a, a group of music. So, so the, the, the thing is, there's an overwhelming need for me to do this music right now mm -hmm. and to communicate through song. Also, Laura Ingram's book, Shut Up and Sing. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, it sounds like a joke. But I, was, I remember when that book came out, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, I've been given a gift by God to sing. I have, because it's a gift from God. Mm -hmm. I says, and I haven't. I haven't used it. And that's really what I says. And how better, what better way to communicate to people and bring people together than through singing, mm -hmm. no matter what their political ideology, no matter what their mm -hmm. race, religion, you know. Right. And that, that was, uh, and that impulse and the need to express through song just mm -hmm. grew. Oh, Ingram's critique was that there are a number of performers who feel compelled to let their political hair down and let their political uh, voice be heard at, to the, at the expense of their song. Mm -hmm. Though I doubt if she'd have a problem with your political <laughs> voice being heard, but we'll leave that aside for the moment. Uh, but I just loved it. Shut up and sing. Shut up and no, sing. No, no, but that made so me... So you're doing it. Well, I'm, I, so I'm doing it. And, 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 you know, that's, again, this music was what made the world fall in love with America. It's yeah, the, why this music? Well, and and what, this American songbook, as it's called, this is music basically from the 1920s to the 60s. Right. Uh, Tin Pan Alley stuff, a lot of it came from Broadway and Hollywood musicals. Why do you think it's so lasting and people are still drawn to it? And why are you specifically drawn to it? Well, first off, the, as you said, where it comes from, the music, and you had the great uh, black jazz and jump blues artists. Mm -hmm. You had, you know that created a style of music that at that time was the jazz. Mm -hmm. And you, the Louis Armstrongs and, you know, the, all mm -hmm. these great artists and Billie Holiday. Then you had the writers that were writing the songbook, the Harold Arlen, mm -hmm. the Cole Porter, the uh, um, Yip Harburg, yep. the Gershwins, the Irving Berlin. Mm -hmm. And you have all these guys. I mean, Irving Berlin, you've got to realize, wrote the song over there. 
And he got the medal, Congressional Medal of Honor because during World War I, when they did over there, that song united our country and became from isolationist, helped bring troops o over there. Mm -hmm. And Caruso sang that song, and my grandfather played that song for me as a kid huh. on that old Victrola that huh. we had in the basement. So this music has a, uh, I grew up on it along with Caruso and mm -hmm. Sinatra, and I just understand, it has an optimistic, uh, hopeful uh, feeling about it. It transcends nationalities, it transcends your time uh, uh, at my concert in, in, uh, last week in the Grove. I happened to be, when, I, when luckily, you were at the Grove, I was there. And I've got to tell you, you had what, 30 pieces, 30 piece orchestra, yeah. I mean it's a big orchestra. The thing that struck me, you had a, a few invited people down front. Behind the barricades were teams of young people who were just strolling around shopping, mm -hmm. eating. They came out of these places and they, they gathered around the barricades to listen to you. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating to watch all of these people kind of bounce to this beat, mm -hmm. but they were very attentive. They were listening. They mm -hmm. were watching. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was interesting for me to see that because, frankly, I didn't expect that. I thought, oh, this will be nice. Those of us who know the music are going to love this. But it was people who obviously this was new to them, mm -hmm. but it resonated. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it resonates? The, part of the thinking is, and, and, and a lot of people are saying, you know, I look at Goonies, James mm -hmm. Bond, Die Hards, Cops and <laughs> Robertsons. I mean, the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of film that I've done. Right. And uh, the, the, the amount of people culturally that over the years that remember the face, maybe necessarily. Mm -hmm. So that, that's part of that. But, right. the, but beyond that, this music from 10 to 80, you can, you know, Lady Gaga might have a niche. <laughs> this one might have a niche. This music doesn't. This music encompasses everyone that hears it, falls in love with it, and uplifts the spirit of the whole country and the world. So, so you really, you really see this almost as a as a mission to unite people via song, oh, yeah. to to unite the country and restore that sense of optimism and and joy that perhaps we're not feeling so much these days. That's a thousand percent. I mean, that, if, if anything, look at the divisiveness we have, you know, the political parties, and, and I blame both political parties. There's nobody that's innocent in, in, in what's happened to our great country here. Mm -hmm. And again, this is the golden age of American music. We have, the, the, t the title of it is Dobby Singh Sinatra on the Road to Romance. Why? And, why why'd you title it that? Well, while it has certain aspects of romance from the meeting and the seduction, the elation of seduction mm -hmm. and falling in love and then uh, the depth of love and then falling out of love and the despair of love and then mm -hmm. reawakening right. and then finding oneself. Besides that transition, it's the romance that we have for America to reawaken our and, and re-inspire our uh, love affair with our country mm -hmm. and not go around apologizing for, for, for what, you know, men and women make decisions, not the country as a whole. The ideal of America should be held and, 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 and celebrated and that's what this music does. It doesn't tear it down. It yeah. celebrates this country. And the, the country relies upon our principles, our values, and the heart of the country, which we often forget about. Look, in 1958, a song called All the Way by Sammy Kahn and Jimmy Van Eusen, when Sinatra sang it for, uh, uh, the, what was this, uh, the thing with... Uh, the Joker's Wild. Joker's Wild, Joker. when he played Joey yeah. Lewis, right? right? Won the Oscar. All right, so you think about the cultural... This is when women were revered. They were respected. Mm -hmm. Even in deep, deep despair, there was still a place and a, still a, an honor of and respecting mm -hmm. women in the song. And these songwriters knew that. And this is what, and Sinatra understood that. Mm -hmm. And that's what this music has, not only in terms of uniting us, but culturally sending a message to the youth and to people that this is, you know, this is the standard. Mm -hmm. This is the standard. I want to give people a little taste of Davi Singh Sinatra. You're going to have Rotoro to make a pizza romance. for that, though. No, 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 no. Just a, <laughs> a little, little taste. taste. <laughs> a little taste. Here we go. Take a look. I've got the world on a string, sitting on a rainbow. Got that string around my finger What a world, what a life I'm in love I've got a song that I sing I can make the rain go Anytime I move my finger Lucky me, can't you see I'm in love Well, that, that's just a little, a little, uh, 
It's an hors d'oeuvre. Just a little hors d'oeuvre. It's hors not even a taste. No, but if they want the full taste, yeah. get the album. You can get okay. it on Amazon or you can get it on iTunes. All or right, Barnes right. And we're going to do the pitch. But for it. The, the Venetian, February 23rd, oh. 24th, and 25th. Oh, so you're going to be performing live in Vegas. And you're touring the country, aren't you? Going to oh, do yeah. Other concerts? Yeah, eventually they're putting that all together. Yeah. Wow. This yeah. is something. I mean, it's beautiful with an orchestra. The orchestra alone is so amazing. Yeah. And then you come out, and there's a. Your love of the material and your love of Sinatra is apparent. Tell me about that. Why Sinatra? Why not Davi sings Perry Como? <laughs> you know, I, uh, Perry Como is a sweetheart of a guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? I remember watching. My mom used to yeah. love watching Perry Como. Yeah. You know, Kraft, was it Perry? Yeah. And all the, all the things. I did my first film with Sinatra. Mm. And in an Italian household, you had a couple of figures <laughs> that were revered. Yeah. The Pope and Sinatra. Yeah. And maybe not necessarily in that order. Okay, well, okay. <laughs> but, but I mean, uh, in my course, house, you, they're, you, I, they are on an they, equal plane. I have to admit, you know, Saint Francis of Hoboken Saint, and the Pope. Yeah, you know, we got to no, <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes. So there was just, in terms of growing up and listening to Caruso and Sinatra, and the, him being the standard bearer for this mm -hmm. music, I was always into voice. Number one, mm -hmm. great voice. What made a great voice from Caruso's bel canto? Sinatra took that Italian bel canto and, and was the first one to put it to popular music. Mm. So that was the first enamored thing. Then his acting. Yeah. He was a terrific actor, as you know. Yep. Now, add on top of that, I got to do my first film with him in 1977. Contract on Cherry Street. Yes, where I played a thug. I oh, played yeah. a hitman. <laughs> How close were you to him? I mean, you remained very friends oh, through yeah, the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were very... Uh, How close was I? I'll give you two stories. Okay. One is uh, Social Club, imagine this in, in Little Italy, mm -hmm. 2 o'clock in the morning. You're a 20-something Italian-American boy that is acting. And you're standing on the side like this, and you're, you're watching, and you're thinking to yourself, my first film with Sinatra, amazing. Mm -hmm. And he's there with Martin Gables, who was married to Arlene Francis, mm -hmm. and uh, Harry Gordino, and Marty Balsam, and some other interesting characters. Mm -hmm. And he sees me out of the corner of his eye, and he said, Robert, have a drink. I says, I don't drink, Mr. Sinatra. He says, you don't drink, you're fired. I says, I'll have what you're having. He says, come over here. So he puts me by the bar, gets the bottle of Jack Daniels, puts out the glass. He says, here, this is how you drink this. Bing, bing, bing. And now, ever since, I've been drinking that Jack Daniels. <laughs> well, I, I hope not tonight. That's, that's all no, later. No, no, you later. drink it later. Later, later. No, no, but I mean, I don't, you know, I'm, I know. it's a sippy okay, thing. OK, tell me the then, second story. The second story is this. I was working as a waiter at a place in New York. I won't mention the name of the restaurant. Okay. And I had gotten, I was studying with Stella Adler, yes. our mentor, yeah. and uh, in New York. And uh, I finally get this, uh, uh, I get fired from the waiter's job I had. <laughs> we had just finished the three-year se session with her that I had. Right. And now I was able to go audition, but I had this waiter's job with three days a week, let me pay my rent and let mm -hmm. me do everything I needed to do. Right. And I got fired. And I got fired because I, I wasn't paying off the general manager. Mm -hmm. I found out later on. There was mm -hmm. something, and, um, and I wasn't hiding receipts and stuff. Because uh. I, I was making higher receipts than everybody else, because I, I didn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I was you too, weren't gaming the system. I wasn't gaming the system. Yeah. He, he has the words for things. Okay. He knows. It's why you're the, it's why you're the host there, this Johnny, what I get Johnny Carson over okay. there. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Carson of the Catholic it's, set it's right it's here. It's what I do. Yeah, I know. Go ahead. So anyway, Harry Guardino knocks on my trailer one night. And he says, come on, we're going to dinner. I said, OK. He says, yeah, old man wants to take us to dinner. We get in the limousine. We drive. A few other guys mm -hmm. were there. Jilly was there. And uh, we pull up to this restaurant, which was across from Lincoln Center. Okay. That's the restaurant you've been fired the, from. The restaurant that I was fired from oh, about boy. a month and a half, two months earlier. Oh, boy. Because I got this film right after mm -hmm. that. I mean, it was like all this divine kind of, and I'll tell you some divine story uh -huh. in a second. But that happens. And they just, he just smiles at me. We go in, we sit down, we have a meal. And all the guys I was working with before <laughs> are like, you know, dropping their trays and they're, you know, <laughs> what's, spilling what's their Bobby drinks. What's Bobby doing with Sinatra? Here I am. With, yeah. and, and, and nothing was ever said, but it was just a smile. Wow. And that was it. That was it. The other interesting thing is um, my, um, my mother, my sister told me this, who was then, uh, later on, she was murdered by her ex-boyfriend, my yeah. sister Yvonne. Oh, sorry. She was a 20-year-old girl. But she told me the story. The, the, the week I got the part, my mother went into the hospital 
diagnosed of, uh, uh, of lung cancer. She died by the time we finished filming. But she understood that her son, who wanted to be an actor, did his first film with Frank Sinatra. So now what you have is, a, uh, my sister tells me about a year later before she uh, had that tragic end. She said, you know, I never told you this, but mommy was watching like the uh, Mike Douglas show or one of those Merv Griffin talk shows like mm -hmm. yours, yeah. and they were interviewing Sinatra, and he was talking about his new film, uh, you know, his new uh, Cherry Street film. And my mother said into camera, Frank, help my son. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that was a weird, weird... Huh. Uh, you, you've had a number of these, um, I guess, divine brushes, little um, signal graces in your life. There was a story about Padre Pio that yeah. we got so much mail about last time you? you told it. Can you tell that story? Sure. What happened? I was about 15 and a half. I was playing football at Seton Hall High School. I was all county, all state, big strapping guy, great at football, winning awards in, in yeah. sports and, and singing. Wow. And I, right after football season, I had gotten ill. And, you know, you think it's just some little illness that'll get better, and it didn't. It just kept going and going and going until finally I'm wasting away at 160 pounds. Mm. They put me in the hospital. They have no idea what I have after several months. Mm. And my friend, Joey, my m m parents' friend, my mother was head of confraternity for Long Island. Mm -hmm. My dad was a sacrist in the St. Matthew's Parish in Dix mm. Hills. And uh, this friend of theirs and ours, Joey Lamangino, used to oh. give prayer meetings about the Holy Rosary. Right. Lady of Garabandal. And a big promoter of Padre, Padre Pio. Pio. And Padre Pio. Mm -hmm. And he used to go to Padre Pio in San Giovanni Rotonda in Foggia, Italy, Joey Lamangino, who was a blind guy. Right. And, um, and I used to go to those. Mm. And uh, I remembered, and I'm in the hospital, and I said to my mom, Mom, do you think you can ask Joey Lamangino if he can talk to Padre Pio? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they did. They talked to Sal De Rosa and Marianne De Rosa, who were close to Joey and blah, blah, blah. And then there was a telegram sent back from Padre Pio, pray blessings, I'm no doctor. But they gave me a pair of rosary beads that he blessed for me. Wow. And a week later, I'm in the hospital. I couldn't get up. Now I'm, I started to walk the next day after this rosary bead incident and the incense and smell of incense and my mother dreamt of Padre Pio's mass. The doctor said to my mother, Mary, if you told me your son would be in this shape, uh, a week ago, I'd, I'd have to say, only a miracle. Mm. So to me, that's why I'm sitting here today. And I, and I really believe that the, 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 the... And one of the sisters had told me at Seton Hall, she says, you were saved for a specific reason. God will reveal his plan, you know? Mm. And uh, this, I think, this moment is that plan. This music. This music, yeah. Me, because singing was such a huge part of my life, Raymond. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a hobby. It wasn't... I was... And I was, I was substantial. But you, but you left it alone, aside for a long time. I mean, I do remember in the Goonies. My kids watch it all the time. Right. You do sing in the middle of the Goonies. Right. But There's a little, you guys kind of sing in the background. Yeah, that was an improv. Ah. That wasn't in the original script. Uh -huh. That was something I wanted to endow the character with. Uh -huh. But the singing was a, uh, this, this right now, because I feel we need, we need some positive uh, uh, reinforcement in our country. You know, the show I do is Dobby Sings Sinatra on the Road to Romance, a tribute to Sinatra, the great American songbook in America. Oh. So there's the thematic element throughout th that show is, is a much deeper, uh, it, 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 it resonates on a, on a, on a very, very uh, deep level. Well, uh, tell me as an actor, how do you approach this material? Because, I mean, you've called it America's Shakespeare, the, these songs. Uh, how do you approach them? And is that different from the way you've seen other singers approach the same material? Well, I don't know how they approach the material because I only know the result of their approach. Yeah. My approach, and this happens, you, I start with the lyric. Mm -hmm. And that's my un understanding of the lyric and my interpretation of the lyric and personalizing that lyric. And mm -hmm. the lyrics are so beautiful and great that, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, I get up there in 25 songs and if, you know, I mean, how do you remember all that stuff? Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, but, but there's such great lyrics, so it's not, and it's part of your organic it's indelible. process. indelible. Yeah. Indelible. So I approach that lyric, I personalize it, and then bring it to whatever universal level I can bring it to. Mm -hmm. Stella used to teach us class on Sinatra. Yep. And she used to have that whole thing about approaching the lyric and how he probably approached the lyric, which he did uh, mm -hmm. from the lyric first, as you know a lot yeah. about Sinatra. Well, she, people, people don't realize, Stella Adler, trained 
Frank Sinatra at MGM. At MGM. She was his acting coach at MGM. Judy Garland, yeah. Sinatra. I mean, uh, really, the whole, the whole clan the whole of clan. of of, of uh, musical yeah. and acting giants yeah. really passed through this woman's hands at one time or another. And and here's Robert Dobbin. Yeah, yeah. So, I have to say the other thing I loved about it and watching it live, not only do you obviously love this material, and you've referenced it by allowing a full orchestra to accompany you. Mm -hmm. It's not truncated, it's not three pieces, it's mm -hmm. not you and a piano. We've all heard those kind of covers. Uh, it's mm -hmm. full out, but you come to it not only as an actor, but also as an Italian. And I think mm -hmm. there is something in the Italian-American experience oh, sure. that is uniquely bound up with Sinatra and these particular pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the torch has yeah. been passed. Well. Thanks. It's a, you know, it's just an incredible experience. But the and the immigrant struggle yep. again. And Sinatra was the first guy, first superstar, that came out against anti-Semitism or any racial bigotry. Mm -hmm. He was colorblind and racial blind. Uh, you know, he he and he he had a very interesting transition transitional thing politically uh, in, later on in life. Right. But he understood. He understood on a different purpose. That's where the difference of lyric is. The question you just mm -hmm. asked, in a way, I think, is that epic understanding of your purpose and the, your communication with the song. Yeah, fantastic. Robert Davi, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for Thank coming you. on. Davi sings Sinatra on the road to romance. It's available online at Amazon.com and iTunes, and uh, anywhere where fine CDs are sold. And for tour information, you really should see this live. Visit DaviSingsSinatra.com. Well, that is all the time we have, but you can follow me online, RaymondArroyo.com. If you're interested in the Truth and Life audio Bible, it makes a terrific stocking stuffer. Also, my book with Laura Ingram of The I Zing is still available at bookstores everywhere. You can find out more at RaymondArroyo.com. And don't forget to follow me on Facebook and Twitter. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. See you next time. Bye now.